Hi, this is Jason Gorman from Codemanship with a whistle-stop tour of the test-driven object-oriented design slides. Um, these form part of the new improved test-driven development workshop that we run through Codemanship. If you'd like to tackle the exercise, um, then you can download these slides, which include the user stories that you'll use in the exercise uh, from this location. Now, if you're doing object-oriented design, in fact, if you're doing any kind of product design, really, um, it's considered wise to start by asking the question, who will be using this software and what will they be using it to do? So we want to identify, first of all, who the users of our software are and what their goals are going to be. If you're doing extreme programming, you may well be using user stories to uh, informally capture this information. Remember, these are not detailed requirement specifications. This is just a sort of a placeholder to have a conversation with that particular user or someone that who represents that particular user about this particular um, goal. So the most important piece of information that I get from a user story when it comes to design are who is the user, so as a video library member, and what is their goal? So their goal is to donate a DVD to the library. Once we've understood the user and what their goal is, we can then sit down with that user or someone who represents them, and we can agree acceptance tests that will let us know that the user is indeed achieving their goal from using this particular feature. So this here's an acceptance test for donating a DVD um, that is uh, in a fairly abstract, slightly ambiguous style here. And, and the most important thing to uh, identify from an acceptance test is the outcomes of the test. What do we expect to be the end result? What is the end of this story, if you like? Um, and I've identified from this particular acceptance test five unique outcomes. Now let's put some flesh on the bones here. You, you really do need to be specific. If you want to have an executable test, then you need to use specific examples. So here, here's the same test, but this time we've gone down into the, uh, uh, the, the, the specific detail of what, which title, which particular member, and so on and so forth. So that we've got a test that we could actually execute if we had a working version of the software. Um, and this is us telling this particular story from the perspective of the user. Now this metaphor of, of telling uh, a story is very, very important to how I'm, I'm going to describe how we do OO design in a test-driven way. And um, the first thing we want to do when we, we tell a story is identify the characters in our story. So what I've done here is I've just informally modeled, sketched out, doodled, um, who I think the characters involved in this particular acceptance test are, and how I think these characters are related to each other, how they know each other. Now, you want to steer away from doing data models. This is a kind of a data model, um, but it's really not a data model. It's a sort of a domain model, but I, I prefer to steer away from all of that because, as we'll discuss later, it can lead to data-centric designs, and that can, that can lead us to all sorts of problems um, in terms of dependencies. So, so although it is very good to have this kind of concept map of who's involved in this story and how do they know each other, um, don't get lulled into thinking that what we need to do next is then come up with a data design or, or a database schema or whatever. Let's steer away from that. Let's focus instead on telling the story. The process of software design is the process of, of telling the story of how the user gets those outcomes, how the software achieves those outcomes, in terms of things that the software is made of. So object-oriented software is made of objects, and in particular we're interested in the roles that those objects play, the responsibilities that those objects take on in doing the work, like which object does what, and the collaborations between these objects, the messages they send to each other, the cues they give each other, if you, if you like, if we're sticking to that metaphor of storytelling, the cues they give each other um, to coordinate doing the work. So we're going to tell the story in three different ways. First of all, we're going to tell the story in the passive. That is, we're going to describe what has to happen in a particular order. So we're going to say the abyss is added to the library with the title name The Abyss, and then one rental copy, copy is registered to. So we're telling it in the passive. We're not saying which objects are doing what yet. Okay, so tell the story in the passive and tick off those outcomes. The most important thing is those outcomes have to be achieved. We're being test driven, so we're being driven directly by how do we achieve these outcomes. Okay, once you have a passive story that achieves the outcomes, that gives us the ending, gives the user the ending that they want, um, then we can assign responsibilities to characters in our story.
for each of these particular pieces of work. Now there's a whole, we could write a whole book about assigning responsibilities in object-oriented design, but a sort of a, a pithy, slightly um, oversimplified way of putting it might be to put put the work where the knowledge is. I'll explain why that's, why that's important later, but what we're trying at the moment to do is to put the work where the knowledge is. So in asking who should add the abyss to, to the library, well, let's go back and ask the question, who knows about titles? Uh, and therefore, who should be responsible for adding titles? And the answer is the library. So the library should be adding the abyss to itself. Now, a lot of people have a problem with this because we humans have a natural inbuilt tendency, an inclination, if you like, um, to separate agency and data. We'd rather have objects that do stuff and other objects that know stuff. So we'd, ra we'd rather have controllers and entities, for example, or services and domain objects than to, to, to combine these two things and have, have domain objects that actually do stuff to themselves. Um, but in OO design, in good OO design, there's a really good reason for, for, for doing that. So well, that's exactly what I've done here. I've, I've distributed the work to where I believe the knowledge is. Um, so now we're telling the story in the axiom. You'll notice I put a ring around the third step there, sending an email alert. That's because I think there's a whole can of worms potentially in, in terms of design. And I don't want to open that can of worms yet. But we need the can of worms to tell the story. It is involved. Um, so we're going to hide that complexity and defer decisions about how the email alert works until later. But we can still carry on with our design. So we tell the story in the axiom and then finally once we've assigned those responsibilities, we describe how the characters in our story interact with each other to coordinate the work. So these are the collaborations between our objects. Once we have the, the story told in this way, in terms of um, roles, responsibilities, and the collaborations between those roles in our story, and we're confident that by telling the story, we've achieved the outcome, we've, we've reached the ending that the customer is after, then we could do a little bit of simple modeling. So here's a simple technique called class responsibility collaboration cards or CRC cards. Just take a card or a scrap of paper and at the top write the name of the role that that object is playing in our story. Down the left hand side you would write the, the responsibilities that, that role takes on. So you'd write down the things it's responsible for knowing and the things it's responsible, uh, responsible for doing. And on the, the right hand side we would write down um, the, the names of any other roles that it interacts with, that it collaborates with in doing its work. So roles, responsibilities and collaborations can be very simply described using CRC cards. And these can form the basis of um, an object-oriented design as we go in. So just a little talk now about data-centric architectures and data-driven design. So I warned you earlier about, about going down this road of, of, of having data models and having objects that do stuff, that have logic or rules or algorithms, and other objects that just hold data, that holds application state, in this kind of design that we see in this example here. The danger with this kind of design is that we end up creating lots of low-level dependencies between these objects. We have lots of coupling between the classes in our, in our design. If we were to redistribute the responsibilities to where the knowledge is in order to do that work, it no longer becomes necessary for some object that does the work to ask for all this data. They can just tell the objects that have the data to do the work themselves. So tell, don't ask. And that, that allows us to create object-oriented designs where um, the coupling is at a higher level and there's, a, there's much less coupling, much less knowledge sharing between the different objects in our system. And this makes it easier for us to change the software going forward. So tell, don't ask. Very important. Okay, bearing that in mind, we now need to think about implementing our design. So we've got a high-level design expressed in terms of these CRC cards, these roles, responsibilities, and collaborations. We'd like to implement it in a test-driven way. It's become de rigueur um, to do it from the outside in, and we'll get to that in a minute. But first of all, we need to think about um, how we actually unit test. How do we write a failing test based on these CRC cards? Well, there's two strategies we could go for here. It depends on whether or not we're testing that an outcome is achieved or a responsibility is satisfied, or whether we're testing that a collaboration um, is working between two of these objects. So if we're testing outcomes, then we can use a traditional state-based testing so we can write assertions about those outcomes. If we're testing collaborations, we can use mock objects, um, to write tests that will fairly those collaborations don't happen in the way that we, we propose that they should. 
typically what you find is in order to wire a design end together end to end you need sometimes it makes sense to test the outcomes particularly if they're non-trivial so if, if there's an algorithm or something that you want to triangulate towards and and you you know you want to make get it right um, and sometimes it makes sense to test a collaboration what it doesn't make sense to do is to test both of those in the same test now you will notice in these examples that i'm using a mock email alert in both tests but i'm using it for very different reasons in each test in the first test i'm using a mock email alert because i haven't decided yet how email alert works in other words there's no such thing yet as as an email alert or it might be because i'm worried that email alert will actually send an email and that for a unit test that will slow things down and make things uh, a bit sluggish and, and um I want to avoid that, so I might be using a mock for that reason. I'm not using a mock email alert in that first test because I want to test the interaction with the email alert between title and email alerts. The second test is different. I'm using a mock email alert here because I want a test that will fail if title doesn't interact with email alert in the correct way. So two different ways. What I don't want is a test where the interaction could make it fail and I'm testing some outcomes because then your test has more than one reason to fail which means when the test does fail it can be twice as difficult to pin down what actually went wrong here so tests should either be about responsibilities or they should be about collaborations they shouldn't really be about both okay so now we're going to implement this from the outside in which means that we start by writing tests for an implementation of the outermost role the role that faces the external world if you like in our design in this case the outermost role is the library um, and we'll write tests for an implementation of library, mocking its collaborators, title and member. So a real library, but with a mock title and a mock member. When we've got library working to our satisfaction, we'll then move further into the call stack and we'll start writing tests for, say, an implementation of title that uses a mock email alert or an implementation of member. And we'll work our way through the call stack in this way until we're, we're sort of at the heart, if you like, of the application or the bottom of the core stack um, and then that that whole thing is working end to end now it's a good idea also to automate your acceptance tests and there are all sorts of tools that have become very popular for this but I kind of still stick with unit testing tools because we we had we had this hope that customers were going to read our executable tests and they never do uh, and it doesn't seem to matter what tools we use they just don't understand them um, so so we, we, we're, we're, I'm quite happy for customers to execute acceptance test scripts by hand themselves in order to sign off on them. But when it comes to test automation, to be able to regression test for those particular scenarios, I prefer to use a unit testing tool, um, and with good reason. So I'll quickly cover this. Um, polymorphic testing is a technique that allows us to write tests where the object under test can be configured in different ways. So if we wanted to wire our title together with a real IMAP email alert, a real implementation of email alert, we could do it in one version of the test. Um, but if we wanted to use a mock email alert so that it runs quickly, we could do it in another version of the unit test. So using this, this technique of, of, of essentially dynamically substituting um, different versions, if you like, of the of the object under test it allows us to create tests that are the same test and being re, the test code is being reused but the setup is different we, we're allowed to vary the setup so that we can have different configurations so that would allow you for example to write an acceptance test an executable version of our acceptance test um, in such a way that it could be run as an end-to-end -end system test um, or it could just be run as um, an in-memory test, so we might use mock objects for, for example, database connections or for the e um, the email servers and so on and so forth. Anything that it touches outside of the uh, that process, or we could literally just be running the you know with the, with the, just the highest level object. Um, it would be entirely up to us to we could wire these collaborations together differently, and the test would be none the wiser. So there's a simple technique for reusing test code that makes it possible to write acceptance tests that could also be run entirely in memory or could be run as unit tests. Okay, that said, here's the example. Right, so after this slide, we've got a whole bunch of user stories for a very simple video library system. Um, if you don't want to do this example, if, if you'd like to make up your own example, then you can just dream up your own user stories and do your own example. I thoroughly recommend um, doing this in a pair or doing this in a team. If you do it in a team, consider each of you taking a different user story and do it as a sort of a team dojo. So as well as 
you know, practicing your OO design skills as a team, which is a whole different thing to doing it on your own. Um, you can also practice working as a team. So you can practice getting um, source control set up and getting builds and so on and so forth set up. Um, so it makes a really good team dojo. Anyway, there you go. That's test-driven object-oriented design.